Well, do keep uh, your Bibles open to that passage in 2 Chronicles as we look at this story of Josiah together. Now, after uh, preaching on uh, Boaz in Ruth 2 a while back and Samuel two weeks ago, some might say I'm deliberately preaching on all my children's names. Uh, that would be a shocking thing to suggest. Uh, my only response would be three down, one to go. Anyway, uh, but that's not the uh, real reason we're looking at the story of this extraordinary boy king today. Uh, we're continuing our series on children of the Bible. And we come to this boy, Josiah. And this is a story for anyone who has ever been told that they're too young or too old, too posh or too common or, or too fill in the blank, whatever, uh, to be used by God. And it's a story of the hope of God's grace, breaking in even when all else seems helpless. But before we come to our story, we're going to start with a bit of a quiz. I've called this, What's Age Got To Do With It? So a few questions to get you thinking. Uh, Here's the first question, it's a very topical one. It is, uh, youngest and oldest players to play football for England. I do, you don't have to do the name, I know Phil knows them all, so you have to be quiet, Phil. Um, but youngest, so yeah, men and women's teams, uh, so youngest man first, what's the age? Have a guess. 17. Brilliant, very good, exactly. 17 years, uh, Theo Walcott, 17 years and 75 days. Uh, any guess for the youngest woman to play for England football? 18. Oh, not quite, but younger. Ah, oh, very good, Meryl, excellent. It is 16 years, so that's actually Hope Powell, who then went on to become uh, England manager. She was 16 years, 277 days, when she made her debut. And then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, oldest England footballers. Uh, so, for the men, any guesses of the age and name? Brilliant, Zoe. So that's Stanley Matthews, one of Zoe. Uh, and age? No, not uh, and at what at age? Any guesses on age? Not quite. Um, he was 42. Uh, so 42 years, 104 days. Uh, and then uh, for the women, I had to, I had to search hard for this one. It was, uh, it was 36, oh, no, close actually, close to the It was 36 years, 296 days. Very close. Uh, and that was Gillian Coulthard. So very good. First question. Now, second question. Uh, tricky one, actually. How old do you have to be to become US president? What's the minimum age? Not, no, no, not 18. But yeah, we had the same joke as that day earlier. Um, uh, I think 23. No, it's 35. What a random age to choose. But that's, yeah, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> um, and last one. Uh, youngest ever British monarch at the, at the point in which they came to the throne. No. No, younger than that. So. No, it is a Henry. It's a Henry the Sixth. Eight months and twenty-six days. I don't know that. Um, um, yes, that, within the within the limited scope of this quiz, because you could also have actually apparently uh, Mary Queen of Scots was six days old when she became Queen of Scotland. But um, whatever you call it at the time, um, that, that's the extent of my knowledge. But we'll move we'll move on very quickly. <laughs> uh, so, uh, that was a very young age to become king. Obviously, didn't uh, rule till a bit later on. Uh, but that does bring us very neatly to our story today. Because uh, our story is a dramatic one. The kingdom of Judah is in a perilous state. Uh, after centuries of misrule by bad king after bad king, God's people were in a mess. Uh, there was the occasional good king, like, like with Hezekiah, uh, but mostly things just kept on getting worse, and the prophets were warning of judgment coming down the line. Uh, good King Hezekiah's son, uh, Manasseh, he was a disaster. He turned from the true God to worship false gods, even in the temple, God's temple in Jerusalem. And his son Ammon was no better. Uh, came to the throne aged 22. He was so unpopular. He was assassinated just two years later. And so the crown passed to Ammon's son, a boy just eight years old called Josiah. What would this boy do? What kind of king would he be? I mean, with such a a messy backstory, you might expect him to just be a a chip off the old block. 
um, following in the, in the footsteps of his father and grandfather before him, worshipping false gods? Or would he take a different path? Maybe like his great-grandfather, Hezekiah, or even his great ancestor, King David. Which way would he go? Well, let's have a look. If you look at, uh, with me at verse 2, you'll see it says, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he followed in the ways of his father, David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. <laughs> Hooray, another good king at last. One like David. This is great news for God's people. Uh, and what was it about Josiah that made him such a good king? Well, there's just two things that I think we stand out from this story. Uh, firstly, he seeks God. And secondly, he smashes idols. He seeks God and then smashes idols. Well, let's start with the first of those. Uh, the story picks up after Josiah is being king for eight years. Which means, question for you, how, how old is he now? Yeah, brilliant, how about that? 16, excellent. Uh, verse three tells us, in the eighth year of his reign, when he's 16, he's still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. Not the false gods of his father, Ammon, or his grandfather, um, Manasseh. No, he sought the true and living God, the God of his forefather, David. So let's face it, his backstory was a bit of a mess. This is not a foregone conclusion. But he didn't let himself be defined by the failures of the past, by all that had come before. Maybe there are times in your life when you've thought or you've been told uh, you're too young or you're too old uh, to be valued by God, to be used by him. Maybe you have wanted to come to God but, but felt, oh, oh, not someone like me, not with my background or... I just, I just can't, not with everything else that's going on in my life. But if that's you, well, let this story of Josiah be a sign and an encouragement to you. A sign that God can be at work in all sorts of places, through all sorts of people. Whatever stage of life we're in, wherever we've come from or wherever we are, no one is beyond the reach of God's love and his grace. As I was preparing this sermon, this brought to mind someone else who shared that same conviction. Uh, someone who travelled across the world to share the message of God's love and grace with children and young people. Because she knew it didn't matter what age you are or where you're from. I'm talking about our dear sister Joan, who passed away this last Wednesday. Uh, you might have seen in the church email yesterday, I sent a link to this wonderful story on the, uh, the Child Evangelism Fellowship website. It's the mission agency Jane served with for many years in Asia. Uh, as it tells the whole story uh, of Jane's uh, life and ministry in, uh, in East Asia. And do take time to have a look through it. If you haven't already, if you haven't got the link, do come and uh, ask me afterwards. It's a really encouraging story. And I was struck uh, reading the, the little uh, information about the, how that um, agency was founded. It was because the founder of that, of that um, fellowship was told as a child that he was too young uh, for the gospel. He wanted to know about Jesus, but was told, no, you're too young for that. Um, but later in life, uh, after he'd become a Christian, he, he had this, uh, came to this conviction that the, Bible, the gospel is not just for grown-ups, it's for children as well. So some people of every age and stage. After all, didn't Jesus say, let little children come to me? And that same conviction led Joan to offer a lifetime of service to God, sharing about Jesus through kids' camps and Bible clubs and many other ways. And that's the same conviction that we try to live out in our churches here as well, offering the gospel uh, to children and young people and people of every age. But uh, turning back to Josiah, we've seen um, kind of how that sort of conviction and that, that, that desire to seek God played out in Jane's life. Uh, how does it play out in King Josiah's life? What did that look like for him? Well, it is something uh, very dramatic. Uh, yes, it's time for smashing idols. That's a bit of a surprise. Uh, it's now four years after Josiah started seeking God. So how old is he now? Yes? 20, very good, we've got some excellent mathematicians at the back there. He's now 20, and he starts a new project. 
Not a building project, more kind of the opposite. Uh, you see, while Josiah was seeking to worship the true God, most people around him were worshipping all sorts of false gods and idols. Sun gods, moon gods, star gods, gods to help your crops grow, gods to help with having children, all sorts of gods. And Josiah was distressed by this. Uh, didn't these people realise that, that God was the one who made all these things, the sun and the moon and the stars, who made the rain fall on the crops? It was God, not the things that he'd made, that they should be worshipping. These gods were no gods at all. They were just worthless statues. Uh, so what did he do? He went into destruction mode. Now, I'm going to need a few helpers to help me with a little bit of historical reenactment here. Uh, there are six idols hidden around the church, wrapped in foil, a bit like that one there. Um, I need a few helpers to come and find some and bring them to the front, and we'll do a bit of reenacting uh, what Josiah did. So off you go. Don't destroy them before you get here. And we're going to break them into here. So you found a couple, I can see if you, everyone, everyone's free to help with this if you'd like to. There's no limits on ages if you want to help as well. Oh, well spotted. Very good. Those ones will do. Yeah, and let's grab this one as well. Let's stick with those ones. If there's any more, we can find them afterwards and destroy them. Right, so I need you now. You're gonna, you're gonna come and help, sir. You need to destroy them, smash them up into this bucket. So you don't need any more than that. You need to break them up as well. Can you help break them up, sir. That's it. Right down to the every last cheap play block. Very good. Yeah, right, very good. Well done. Keep you going to sit down. Very good. So uh, we brought our idols to the front. We took them apart. We uh, smashed them right into rubble. We had there were bars, there were Asherah poles, the whole lot. Uh, hang here, we can say our helpers did a smashing job. Sorry. Sorry. Anyway, moving on quickly. Uh, so the idols were dealt with. Uh, that's what decided. We got the idols, smashed them to pieces. Uh, but why did he do this? Uh, wasn't this all just a little bit excessive, a little bit over the top? Well, no. Uh, things they, they may have just been statues of wood uh, or, or duplo, uh, but these idols, uh, they were pulling people away from the true and living God. They were cutting them off from the life and blessing that was to be found in him. Uh, not to mention the, the terrible things that, that they did when they were sacrificing to these idols. If God's people were to have any hope at all, uh, these idols had to go. Uh, so Josiah starts, we see it in our passage, he starts in the capital city, in Jerusalem. So circle there on the screen, that's, that's where he lived, that's an obvious place to start. But he went on uh, to the whole of Judah, the whole of his kingdom, where he was uh, ruling over. We see that in verse 6. He then goes beyond that. He doesn't stop there. He goes beyond his borders, uh, right into the, what was the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, by, by this stage of Israel's history, actually the northern kingdom had already been taken away into captivity because of their uh, worship of false gods. Uh, but Josiah goes into this land, into the ruins of this land, and tears down the altars and the idols that he finds there as well. From Simeon in the south, right up to Naphtali in the north. Uh, smashing the idols, destroying their altars. And why does he do this? Uh, to help draw people away from these worthless idols back to the true and living God, so they would worship God and find life in him. At the end of uh, verse 7, we see Josiah comes back home to Jerusalem. Is that job done? Well, no, there's still more to do. He's torn things down, now he wants to build things up. He wants to help repair God's temple in Jerusalem, which is a great story. Uh, unfortunately, that is a story for another day, but do uh, carry on and read it at home later. It's an amazing story. But Josiah carries on 
serving God right through the next uh, the 31 years of his reign. Now, overall, he is a great king. Uh, here's the glowing write-up he receives in 2 Kings chapter 23. It says, Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he <laughs> did, with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength. You can hear an echo there of the great commandment, can't you? Of loving God with all our being. And that's what the, uh, 2 Kings says about Josiah. What a great guy. I mean, you think, well, after all that, uh, things would work out just fine, wouldn't you? You think, well, that must set them on the right course. Well, sadly not. Uh, Josiah's sons are a disaster. Uh, they turn away from God, back to serve these idols again. Before long, God's people are taken away into exile in Babylon. Just about 25 years after Josiah died, uh, Jerusalem was sacked. Uh, by the Babylonians, and they're all taken off into captivity. What a disaster. See, just see, see what happened was, Josiah did really well in removing the physical idols from the land, but that was never enough. See, he couldn't remove the sin from people's hearts. He couldn't remove that sin that made them want to worship idols in the first place. But one day, centuries later, there would be a king who came to do just that. One of Josiah's descendants, the one who also sought after God from a young age, doing the will of his father in heaven. That king is Jesus, of course. Jesus, who, who didn't just come to deal with physical idols and statues. No, he came to deal with the real problem, the sin in our hearts. You see, idolatry, that's the word for worshipping idols, it's, it's more than just fancy statues and carved wooden poles. An idol is really anything that we put in God's place, that, that we worship and serve instead of him. And that could be a whole range of things, and even really good things. Almost anything can become like an idol if we make it more important to us than God is. Some, some examples. So for some people, it's money or fame or power that they're seeking after, and that becomes everything to them. But for others, even uh, really good things like serving others, showing kindness to others, and, and, or, or exercise, or academic achievement, all good things, they can become idols if they become our ultimate value, the, the centre of our lives. And so, if, uh, what, if that's the case, what should we do? Well, it's not just about smashing them. For, for, for lots of these things, that just won't work. And in some cases, it might be that there's something in our lives that is stopping us coming to God. That's a real thing that we might need to get rid of or avoid a particular place. But more often, the root cause is in our hearts. And that's not so easy to deal with. But wonderfully, that's exactly what Jesus came to do. You see, Jesus has dealt with our sin, including our idolatry, by taking all our sin on himself, on the cross, so we can be forgiven and free. He's dealt with our problem in a way that Josiah never could. Because on top of that, he gives us a new heart. He gives us his holy spirit. Uh, to live in us, to help us, to want to serve God and not idols. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us, to, to direct us towards doing that. And that is something wonderful that we can give God great thanks for. Uh, so what can we take uh, from this story of boy King Josiah? Uh, the king, boy who became a king, and a king who sought God and smashed idols. Well, perhaps uh, just two challenges. Firstly, a challenge to seek God. Uh, whoever we are, wherever we've been, whatever we've done, we can come to God just as we are, uh, to receive his love and his grace, to be part of his family. That is what is offered to us. So we see Josiah doing, seeking God. And if that's something that you have never done before, well, then today is a great day to start. It doesn't need to be complicated. It's just asking God for help. Uh, reading about him in his word, the Bible, asking him to reveal himself to you. And if that's you, well, do you please come and speak to me afterwards.
So that's seeking God. Secondly, dealing with idols. You see, we are all works in progress. All of us, at whatever stage of the Christian life we're at, God is still at work in our lives. And, and we can ask him to show us those ways that we've allowed things to become a bit like idols in our lives, taking his place. Maybe we start to put our hope in our money or our power or our status, not in God. Uh, maybe even doing things for God can take the place of knowing God directly. I know that's a trap that I can fall into at times, that that sort of takes God's face at the centre. It could be a whole range of things and a different thing for each one of us. So in a moment, we'll just take a few moments to reflect on our, where our own hearts are at in this. Because uh, it is not an easy thing. It's hard to know when you kind of cross the line from uh, wanting to do something as a good thing to honour God uh, and, and allowing that thing to take on too big a role and in the centre of our affections. But the promise is that when we keep God in his rightful place, when he, we put God and his kingdom first in our lives, well, everything else finds its proper place as well. And we can find ourselves in a place where God can work through us and use us in ways that we had never imagined. Because a life lived in God's service is never put to waste. And we've seen that was true for boy King Josiah. And we've seen that it was true for our sister Joan as well. Uh, and may that be true for each one of us too. So let's just take a few moments now just to reflect on what God is saying to us through his words today before we move on to sing our next song. Father God, we thank you so much for this story of Josiah. Thank you that he, uh, he came to seek you. You caused him to seek you from a very early age. Lord. Thank you that you called each one of us uh, to come to you and to seek you as well, and to find the joy and the peace and the love that is found in you. And thank you for the example of Josiah that he sought uh, to turn people's hearts to worship you. Uh, but we thank you even more uh, for all that the Lord Jesus, Josiah's even greater son, uh, has done for us uh, to help us uh, to forgive our sins through the cross, that we might serve you fully and wholeheartedly. Please help us as we reflect on those things in our hearts, but perhaps ways in which we other things have taken your rightful place as number one in our lives. Pray you'd help us to, uh, to root those out and to commit ourselves to serving you fully. Thank you that there is grace uh, in all our failings, that your mercy is new every morning. So help us to trust in that and be reassured in that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.